Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we have a compilation. This compilation is all to do with skinwalkers and cryptids, which I know are two of some of our favorite topics here on this channel. I've never done a compilation video before, mainly because I started my channel in February, so I haven't exactly had the volume to warrant a compilation. But since I've been hard at work on Dracula and the podcast, and just a few other things that I have in the works that I haven't mentioned yet, all of which I'm trying to get done in November, I decided to take it easy and not record anything new for this particular video and just do a compilation. So I think these are some of my favorites actually in this particular topic anyway. And so I do hope you guys enjoy. I, for one, like to go back and revisit stories that I enjoyed in the past uh, every once in a while. So I hope you guys do as well. If you have gotten to the end of this video and you still aren't, aren't satisfied, you need more scary in your life, well, good news because Mortis Media graciously invited me back on his channel again this week. I know I was just there last week, but uh, he invited me back again this week. Never going to complain about that. It's always a great time to collaborate with him. And uh, so there's a haunted house video that's up tonight, and I can't wait to uh, listen to the rest of the stories that Mort narrated. Obviously, I know the stories that I did, but I can't wait to hear the rest of them. So definitely head on over there. There's a link in the community tab, and I will try to remember to link it in this video as well. Um, definitely go over there, leave a like, leave a comment, and uh, show Mort some love. So um, then come back here and finish this video, or if you already finished the video, you can peruse what else I have on the channel whilst I put some new things together. So without further ado, get comfortable, grab a beverage of choice, grab a snack, because we're going to be here for a while, and get ready to take another journey into the night. When I was about 11 or 12, we lived in a small house made of mud and stone, a lot like our house now. It was two of my brothers and I in the house. Everyone else had gone to the Hamas feast and left us to tend the sheep. We were getting ready for bed when we heard the dogs going crazy outside. Thinking it was nothing more than coyotes howling in the distance, we told them to be quiet. We began to drift off into sleep but the dogs would not shut up. Somehow, I was able to go to sleep for a few hours. Then, I woke up very late in the night. It was very quiet and still in the house, save for my brother's snoring and breathing. I realized that I needed to use the outhouse, and I woke up my brother to take me there. He teased me about being scared, which was true. I certainly was. We went out with our flashlight to the outhouse. The dogs began with their crazed barking out in the sagebrush, going from one place to the next and back. My brother went first, and I waited outside for him. While waiting, I tried to follow the dogs with my flashlight. Suddenly, there was a very loud whine from one of the dogs. Then everything went quiet again. It was really too quiet for that time of year. Not even the sheep were making noise. Suddenly, I heard a few of the dogs going completely mad by the truck. When I looked over, there was this man. He was unbelievably tall, leaning one arm on the cab roof of the truck. He was looking at the dogs for a little, and then suddenly he started kicking one of them. They all scattered in different directions. This thing looked up at me, and I saw its face. It had a pure white face like a full moon, two burning red eyes, and a slight smile that was pure black. I could not move or make a sound. It began walking toward me with long strides until it finally towered over me. All I began to see was a dark red, like the color of blood when you cut the throat of a sheep. 
I kept getting deeper and deeper into its eyes. I could faintly hear my brother coming out of the outhouse. With this, the thing looked up at him. Reality came rushing back to me. I noticed that my brother was too distracted with his buckle to realize what was going on. I also noticed this thing's long hands hovering just inches from my head. Its skin was black ash, and he smelled like a bloated dead animal in the heat of summer. I was still unable to move or speak. The skinwalker began to move toward my brother. Finally noticing this figure, my brother became paralyzed as I was. Closer and closer it drew, reaching an arm out toward my brother's head. Something finally snapped in me, and I became unbearably angry. I broke from the trance and lunged at the skinwalker, raising my arms like a wild animal and baring my teeth at it. A growl came out of me that I didn't even know I could make. I became more and more hysterically angry at the thing that was trying to hurt us. It kept that smile at first, but the angrier I got, the more the smile faded. Finally, with everything I had left, I began to make this primal roar at the thing. It fell backwards and ran away into the night. Looking back at me, its eyes were dim and dull, its smile now long since gone. The next morning, the family returned home from the feast. After relaying the story to my parents, they quickly hired a medicine man, and we have had no further incidents. Anybody that has been on the Navajo reservation has either heard of some creepy things or have experienced pretty creepy things themselves, namely skinwalkers. I have only ever seen one. Here is my story. I come from a small town in northern Arizona that's sandwiched between the Paiute reservation to the north and the United States' largest Navajo reservation to the south. My high school, being so small, an A1 high school that has, on average, 80 students enrolled every year, I always had to travel south about 5 to 10 hours one way to play another high school in any sport. This means that we traveled a lot on the Navajo Reservation, and we also usually stayed at hotels when we would head out to play and come home in the morning, but this trip was a little bit different. I remember the basketball coach saying that the school didn't have enough money to put the team up in a hotel that trip, so we were going to be on the road for a total of 12 hours. I was the only male senior to play basketball that season. We had just got done playing our game and headed home on our bus, which we affectionately called Big Blue. We were headed out, and it wasn't long, about two hours of driving before we had entered the reservation. By this time, everyone was asleep with it being about two in the morning. When we had crossed the reservation's border, I noticed the bus driver had sped up and was now going at about 85 miles per hour. I thought this was a little weird because he never exceeded the speed limit, at least not in my high school career. For some reason, I couldn't fall asleep like the rest of my teammates, and I just sat at the back of the bus, staring out across the desolate desert landscape, which was lit by the full moon. As I looked out, I could see a figure running toward the bus at an angle of pursuit, and keeping up with the bus at 85 miles per hour. As the figure got closer, I saw that it was a humanoid form. As a matter of fact, it looked exactly like a human, only that the face was painted half black and half white, and it had glowing eyes. Glowing eyes like a rabbit's eyes, reflecting light from a spotlight. I immediately thought, holy crap, that's a skinwalker. The skinwalker ran up to the edge of the road and just kept up pace with the bus, hurtling sagebrush and rocks while staring directly at me. After I made eye contact with that thing, I could not look away. 
It was as if something was holding my head and eyes in place. The skinwalker just smiled at me, this inhuman smile that went from ear to ear, showing crooked, yellow, pointed teeth. I felt like I was going to throw up, and I was panicking through the whole ordeal. The skinwalker started to crumple down to all fours, still keeping up with the bus. I could see his bones crack and reform. Hair started appearing all over his body. And in about three seconds, I was now looking at a coyote. It ran off, back into the desert and out of view. As soon as it was gone, I ran to the onboard bathroom and puked up a mixture of food and blood. I didn't want to tell anyone for fear that they would think I was crazy, but I confided in my Navajo friend. She told me that I needed to see the chief, who also happened to be a friend of mine, and get a blessing. I saw him the next day in school, in the parking lot. He just came up to me and mumbled something in Navajo while waving a feather scepter-like thing, turned around, got in his truck, and without a word, drove away. To this day, I haven't seen another skinwalker. It might be due to the fact that I have since moved away from town and the reservation. And if I ever have to go south, I go around. Way around. I was visiting my grandparents out in Shiprock, New Mexico during last October to see my family, and to go to the Northern Navajo Nation Fair that week. Many Navajo people, including my own family, are very reluctant to speak about skinwalkers because it is believed that even speaking their name can attract their attention. However, I grew up away from the Navajo Nation and was very naive about the subject. When it came to skinwalkers, I was an absolute skeptic. My mom used to tell a story of how back in the 80s when she lived with her siblings and my grandparents, still in Shiprock, but the southern outskirts, how she and my aunt had seen a skinwalker just outside their driveway under a streetlight. She described it as a black dog with dirty fur, a twisted, noodle-like front leg, and these unnatural eyes with a soft, burnt, orange glow. Me, being my own close-minded self, doubted every word, but of course I never spoke my doubts aloud. These doubts totally changed last year when I went to my grandparents' house. Me and my family had just finished going to the carnival at the Navajo Nation Fair and called it a night. The house was close enough where we could walk home in just ten minutes, so we did. When we got there... It was about nine at night, where we stayed up until about two, catching up about family affairs and the local news. It was during that time that I just decided to open my mouth and blurt out a question. Hey, are skinwalkers real? Silence. Guys? I asked. You shouldn't be speaking about that, my grandma said, with almost a disturbed yell in her voice. So she and my grandfather both decided to go to bed. After being scolded by my mom, one of my aunts chimes in, in a very cautious tone, and says, They're real all right. Had a few start screaming outside of my trailer in Farmington just a few nights ago. Your cousin had nightmares the whole night and woke up crying that morning. They're real. Not wanting to push the discomfort any further, we all decided to go to bed. Now the trailer slash home is pretty old and it was really a nice night, so we slept with the windows open, with screens to prevent the bugs from coming in. Everyone had drifted off to sleep, except for me, because my mind was still going a million miles a minute about skinwalkers. I wondered if I ever encountered one while I was here on the reservation... What would I do if I did? As a kid, I was told it was a taboo thing to think about skinwalkers because even that can call their attention. And that's when the shit totally hit the fan. 
Just as I was settling and finally getting relaxed for sleep, I started to hear something moving outside. I get up from the couch and start wandering over to the kitchen window. In the trailer, all of the rooms have the lights out, so the only visible light that can be seen is from the porch out front. I was thankful for this, because I told myself that if it really was a skinwalker outside, hopefully it wouldn't notice me seeing it. So I muster up the courage and take a quick scan of the outside. From the porch light, all I can see is the dusty ground and the vehicles that my family drove, along with some old metal trash cans that stood beside the road. Looking for about a good five seconds, I wasn't able to see anything, so I was getting ready to turn around and walk back to bed, thinking that it was just a stray cat in my imagination. I had only taken about two steps when I heard what sounded like a distorted scream coming from outside, definitely close by. Fear rising, I look outside again, and there, I see it. A coyote-like figure was staring at my direction from behind the cars, just outside of the reach of the porch light. Only it looked awfully wrong, and gave off an evil vibe just from me looking at it. It was gray, with very disheveled hair and a horrific orange-red soft glow that came from its eyes. I noped the hell out of there and ran back to my bedroom. It was at this moment I had begun to also notice an awful stench in the air that smelled like rotting meat. I started trying to wake up my mom, who was like, Oh my god, it's almost 3am, what do you want? I immediately begin to tell her, in a shaking voice, There's something scary outside. Then she said, thoroughly annoyed because I'd woken her up, Ugh, it's just a stray animal or something. It's the res. Animals wander around all the time. Go to bed. She obviously wasn't getting the drift of what I was saying. So I screamed, Mom, there is some Blair Witch shit going on outside. Get up. That got her attention. What? What the hell are you talking about? Then we heard it. The thing outside started making more of its dreadful-like screams and started with sound like thrashing the trash cans on the ground. Hear that? That's what I'm talking about. So both her and I got back up, looked outside the window, and the coyote thing was making its way to the door. It walked with an odd limp and dragged its back right leg as if it had some sort of disability or handicap, like it had been injured. We could hear it start to scratch against the door and make this odd, muffled, moaning sound. My mom went and got my dad, and they both started shouting in Navajo all sorts of words, telling the thing to go away and saying that it's not welcome here. Well, all this commotion was enough to get the rest of the trailer up as they came out into the hallway. The only thing my mom did was turn to all of them and say, Skinwalker, while proceeding to point to the door. The noise is still happening outside. Apparently, they already knew exactly what to do as my grandfather got out a handgun from a drawer and a bag of ashes. He coated a few bullets and loaded them into the gun and went straight to the door, yelling out more Navajo that was too fast for me to comprehend. He swung the door open and fired twice. Nothing. The thing managed to escape before my grandpa could put a bullet in it. That's the fastest one I've ever seen, said my grandpa. Next thing you know, my aunts and my parents are freaking out about what just happened, saying things like, what if it comes back tomorrow? And it saw us. Does that mean we're targets now? Afterwards, my grandparents calmed everyone down, myself included, saying we would all be fine, and we all went to bed. Morning comes, and my grandparents call one of their neighbors to explain what happened. Apparently, one of them was a medicine man who used to partake in yay biches, Navajo ceremonies used for healing and curing sickness. He came over to bless each family member and the grounds outside. Today, I'm very convinced that what I saw was a skinwalker. I still plan on going back for visits to the family and the Northern Navajo Nation Fair. It's really fun. I just adamantly hope that I never have such an awful experience like that again. Hey 
It was 1995, and I had just graduated high school. An old friend who I haven't talked to in seven years now and I were hanging out, and I said, let's go to New Orleans. So we did. We had $140 between us, and back then, that was more than enough. We made it to New Orleans, almost died from culture shock, and turned around and headed to Magnolia, Mississippi, to get some sleep. We stayed at Magnolia Inn. It was a shithole, but it was nice and cool. It was May or June in South Mississippi. Cool was the only adjective that mattered. We stayed up that night, playing poker drinking Gordon's vodka, and talking about who knows what. Probably girls and college girls. At some point, I said, Ever been to Texas? My friend said, Nope. I said, Pack your bag and let's roll. We had a road atlas. Marshall, Texas was right across the border from Shreveport. We arrived in Shreveport, made a phone call to another friend who we were actually supposed to be staying with, Both of our mothers had called looking for us. The only person that knew where we actually were was the buddy on the phone. It was no big deal. We could be home in a day or two. Before we left, before we left that rest area in Shreveport where we made the call, we saw an armadillo. Let me tell you something about armadillos. Those bastards will hiss, jump, and turn into Tasmanian devils if you corner them. They also carry leprosy, we're told. We were 18. We chased that armadillo around for an hour. Now let me tell you about Shreveport. I don't know how it is now, but in the summer of 1995, it looked and smelled like a place where oil and metal went to die. It was dirty. We crossed a bridge and saw people fishing 100 yards from where a drainage pipe from a factory was spewing forth waste upriver from the fishermen. The locals remind me of the locals in Adamsville. Bald-headed women and cross-eyed men. A lot of bald-headed, cross-eyed kids. Listen, I'm sorry, but it was a Rob Zombie movie come to life. I felt like I was going to be killed because I had a head full of hair and I could see straight. The best part of Shreveport was an armadillo that might possibly have leprosy. So we chased it around for a while. But Marshall, Texas was 40 miles away, so we rolled on. Marshall was a decent little town, home of the Fire Ant Festival. We stopped at a little barbecue joint and had a Coke, a smile, and some pulled pork. It was getting late and the sun was setting. We looked at the map and decided to backtrack a bit and head up Rural Route 43 through Karnak and past Caddo Lake. We would eventually run into Highway 59, head to Texarkana, and then head back home. When we left the barbecue joint, we headed towards 43. It was dusk. Highway 43 wasn't well lit. It was almost as dark as Natchez Trace Park. I've got a good story about that place, too. My friend was driving, and we were doing about 45 miles per hour. Any faster would have been reckless even for a couple of 18-year-old dumbasses. This road was kind of like Christmasville Road. If you're a local reading this, you'll know what I mean. If you're not, you'll just have to use your imagination. It was dark, winding, full of hills that ended in curves. There were beady and glowing eyes on both sides of the road. You could hear the crickets and the bullfrogs over the sound of the wind rushing by that old Sentra. It was peaceful and creepy at the same time. The humidity was a real, tangible thing. The air was thick. It smelled like pastures, hay, and swamp. We drove for what seemed like hours. It was after midnight, and I saw a sign that informed me that Bivens was next town of any size. I was hypnotized by the yellow lines on the road. We hadn't seen another car in at least an hour. Sleepy. I rolled the window down and lit a cigarette. There was music coming from the radio, the tape player, as it was. It was either Tupac or something like him. I smoked my cigarette, absentmindedly flicking ashes out of the window. I took one last puff and flicked the camel short off into the woods, and then I saw it. 
I never looked to my right. I didn't even kind of peek to the right. Maybe I did a little when I flicked the cigarette away. I don't know. What I do know is that in my periphery, there was something running alongside the car. It was just behind my window, behind where the edge of the door ends and before where the back window begins. I looked over at the speedometer, 40 miles per hour. I looked at my friend. He was looking straight ahead. I looked straight ahead, but I could still see it. I could see one huge arm, matted hair, reddish brown, sticky looking, primal. I eased my right hand over and rolled up my window. My friend was still looking straight ahead, his jaw clenched. He put both hands on the wheel and sped up. I knew that he had seen it too. We didn't speak a word to each other. I looked straight ahead, but still, out of my periphery, I could see that arm moving, muscles and tendons visibly rippling beneath that matted hair. As the car gained a little speed, the thing running alongside us lost pace, but only slightly. And then I saw the hand on the end of that nightmarish arm. The hand was clenched into a fist the size of a cantaloupe, and a big cantaloupe at that. It was covered in the same hair, but slightly darker around the fingers, like it was stained with something. Suddenly the hand unclenched, and then I saw the claws, black as this damned after midnight Texas night. Those claws were at least two inches long, sharp like an animal's. This wasn't a hand, so much as it was the killing paw and claws of some beast whose only purpose was to kill and eat. I looked back at my friend. I looked at the speedometer. Fifty miles an hour. I looked straight ahead. It was still there. I lit another cigarette, but I didn't dare roll down the window. All I said was, shit. The music had stopped. I finally broke the silence and said, Hey, do you... And before I could finish, my buddy said, I see it. I've been seeing it. I can't even see you, but I can see whatever the hell that shit is. I said, how much do you see? More than I want to. Speed up, I said. Speed up, John. Just speed up. It can't keep up forever. I looked over. 55 miles per hour. Whatever was chasing us, silently, was starting to lag behind. I finally looked to my right. Just a bit. Imagine the scary part of a scary movie, where you put your hand in front of your face, but you still peek through. In 37 years of my life to date, I have two regrets. One is picking up that first cigarette, and the other is looking to my right. This beast was huge. Its chest was above the top of the car, and all I could see was that matted, reddish-brown hair. Then it bent forward as it ran, and I saw the face of this thing, and in that moment, all reality stopped. We were no longer driving down some country road in Texas. We were now trying to escape from the depths of a monster-inhabited hell. The thing's face is beyond my power to describe. It was evil. The eyes were black and the pupils were red. It flashed its teeth at me in a snarl, yellow and huge. Saliva dripped from its mouth. It opened its eyes, wide, and it looked hungry and pissed off. Then it opened its mouth. The skin pulled back until all you could see were black gums and yellow teeth. Immediately, I could feel the car accelerate. Fucking hell, John, just go! I prayed, I swore, I lit another cigarette. Then, like sunshine breaking through the clouds, the road straightened out. I looked at John. Don't you dare slow down. We drove through Bivens, and we drove to Texarkana. Then we drove home. We never said a word. It was years later... 11, to be exact, before we ever could even talk about it again, and we didn't talk about it much. He said that he had never told anyone, and I hadn't either. 
I told the story a few years back for the first time while I was parked out on a gravel road doing the things you do when you're parked out on a gravel road with a good-looking woman. I told it a year or so ago to a couple of kids who wanted to hear a scary story while they sat around a campfire. <laughs> they didn't sleep for a day or two, but they did ask me a dozen more times to tell them the story. Beyond that, I never told anybody until now. And until now, I never told anybody that I saw its face. I've been scared for my life exactly two times. Once was on that road, and once was looking at a grizzly bear in front of me with a terminal velocity-inducing drop to the side of me. Call it what you will. Call it bullshit if you want. But if you could look me in the eyes and let me tell you this story, you would know it's the truth. Never doubt that there are things in this world that defy explanation and logic. The boogeyman is real. Some 16 or 17 years after this happened, I ran across a story and a movie called The Legend of Boggy Creek in Falk, Arkansas, where the aforementioned story and movie takes place. That place isn't that far from Bivens, Texas, as the crow flies. Invite me over. Buy me a beer. Sit on the porch with me, and I'll tell you the story over a pack of Marlboros and a few of those beers. You'll know. I'm telling the truth. This all happened about five years ago. One night, a few of my friends decided after a night of hanging out that we should go on an adventure at about 3 a.m. We took a ride about 50 miles to this old Spanish ruin in New Mexico. It was once the seat of the Inquisition. I can't for the life of me remember what this place is called. We jumped the front gate of the place and started exploring. One of my friends brought a flute with him and he started playing it and about 30 seconds into his mediocre playing, something started screaming really, really loudly on the tops of the long destroyed walls of the place. It was going from wall to wall, really quick, screaming the most blood-curdling scream you could ever imagine. We noped out of there. One of my friends literally pissed his pants, and we drove for a few hours to Bandelier National Monument where we planned to camp out for the rest of the weekend. We got to Bandelier at probably 6 or 7 in the morning and set up our camp. After talking about what had happened at the ruins, I went to take a piss about 300 feet from our camp. This is where everything starts to get a little fuzzy. I remember seeing two dust devils coming my way, and when I turned around again, two of my friends were there, and they were motioning me to follow them. I couldn't help but follow them, like I was being pulled behind them in shackles. I followed them for what seemed like 10 or 15 minutes, but then when I snapped out of it, I realized these were not my friends. They had bright red hair. They had my friends' faces, but they had cat eyes. Both of these friends were brunettes. I stopped walking and they looked at me with probably the most terrifying gaze I've ever seen. Monsters in movies are nothing compared to this. I turned around and ran as fast as I could back the way I came. After about five minutes in a full sprint, I got back to that rock and the campsite near it. Everyone was there, still sitting around, talking. They didn't even notice I was gone. I told them what happened with the look-alike skinwalkers, and we packed up everything and left within about ten minutes and got the hell back to Albuquerque. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of the Peyote Reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame, and every night packed in like sardines. I was on the outside, 
and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this part of the country, but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers, so it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw mat. Anyways, we went to bed one night, and I was still on the edge of the A-frame. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head and pressed my ear, and I was freaking out because it was a really acute pain that I had never felt before. I'm pretty sure I thought I was having an aneurysm. Anyway, I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear, and as soon as he did, he legitimately pissed his pants. Like, he was horrified. So, I'm like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror and holds it up to me. And to my horror, there's a scraggly old man, gray hair, huge tumor on the side of his face in torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us, almost as if he was in a different dimension. We didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. He just wandered away at one point. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both dreamt that this kid Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat naked around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to draw the same picture down to the order we were sitting in and the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left and finally got service, and he said that he had been up all night throwing up. Did we see a skinwalker? I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far a skinwalker territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in there, almost like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark. There were only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty. No other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison. Then two voices talking really quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. Then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute. But we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people who had owned the cars had come back. I didn't think the howl was odd coupled with the voices. I was just thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices. The guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both, or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, 
They both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm, and they said, We have to get out of here right now. I said, Okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went in, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd only been in there for about 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we finally make it to the car, and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently, people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never said the word skinwalkers, though I read about them later, and I finally understood why they were freaking out that night. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious, for lack of a better word. She's not religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana, and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful, Typical, boring, old people stuff. Except, she always kept her curtains drawn shut, and would always peek out the window. And when someone asked what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenel Dushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit, until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma, and my then baby brother, although he's 19 now, were in the front yard that evening, planting flowers, when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting my brother's name and saying, get away from that creature, it's not safe. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had really deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, The Yen El Dushi has found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. This is my first experience with any sort of cryptid or odd creature. Before I had this encounter, I was clueless and had a conversation with my cryptid-obsessed friend, and he told me all about the things that I have seen and what they could have been. Everything he told me seems very convincing, and honestly, it scared me a ton. Anyway, I was visiting a reservoir or nature reserve area with my older brother. We'd gotten there late, and it was rather dark by the time we'd sat down to take pretty pictures of the night sky and all the things we could see. My brother set up his phone to take a picture. I don't know the details of it, but essentially his photo took 30 minutes to take. We sat on a bench and talked while we waited. As we sat there, I heard two loud yelps and a scream not too far in the distance, I brushed it off as some animal freaking out far away, but then I heard footsteps a while afterward. They were on concrete, but the footsteps didn't sound like they were made by the impact of a shoe on hard ground. Again, I brushed it off as an animal. Later, my friend told me that this could have been the skinwalker that I saw later on, and so I now believe it may have followed me. 
moving on to when I actually saw it. Further into the day out, we were walking through the darkness on the way back to the car so we could go home. As we walked, I had my head turned toward my brother as I was telling him about something funny. Midway through my sentence, he stopped, shushed me, and said, What the hell is that? I slowly turned my head to the left, and I saw a slim humanoid standing there, completely still. Its bottom half was covered by the tall grass, and it hunched slightly. My brother shone his phone light at the thing, trying to get a closer look, but it was too far away, and it made practically no difference. I couldn't make out many details, and my phone was dead, so I couldn't snap a photo either. We stood and looked at it for a very short while before getting a little too scared. So, we turned our backs to the thing and continued walking. I continued to look behind my back very, very frequently in case it stalked us, but it disappeared. I could have sworn it was there the past two times I'd looked back. When I was home, I figured that it had either fled or kept following us after being told some info by my friend. My friend told me with fair confidence that I had seen and heard a skinwalker, although he admitted he's not an expert on the topic. I don't know what I saw, but from everything I've looked up about skinwalkers, I think it's probably safe to say that that's what it was. This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest, back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off. It's a forest, after all. And I kept walking. But then I started to hear a low, mumbling noise. So I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded exactly like my brother, saying, Come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance, because although the voice sounded like my brother, something also sounded wrong, like it was distorted. So I waited a few seconds, and then he said again, Come here, I need your help. But in the exact same way as before, almost like it was a recording. So I moved to the side, and that's when I saw it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs, and its body was rigid and twisted. But the worst part was its eyes. They were exactly the same as mine. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed oddly friendly, but nonetheless I was scared. So I ran a mile back, and the whole time... I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappearing behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having dreams, but not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this, and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event that he experienced when he was young. To this very day, I remember how I felt and how threatened it made me feel. This story is one my dad told us when we were younger. This happened in central Wisconsin, when my dad was not even a teenager yet. Wisconsin was even more rural back then, 
and the area has since become more of a city. Anyway, here's the story. My dad and his friend grew up in the country and always walked woods, trails, swamping land, and the like. Not much else to do, but my dad said that he and his friend were walking a path in one of these spots one day, and this black cat kept following them. Anytime they stopped, the cat stopped and stared at them. He said that they would try using stones, etc., not to throw at the cat, but just near it to try to scare it off, but the cat would never get scared. And after a few minutes, they started walking faster, and the cat kept pace. Apparently, they both got a very bad feeling, and so they didn't look back anymore. Once they said that and started walking again, they heard this dark, evil laughter and turned around to see a man in super old school, all black attire, walking away, laughing into the brush. So they freaked out, obviously, and ran away. As it turns out, my grandpa was friends with this other old guy who lived around the area, and I guess my dad knew him and would stop by. After this cat thing happened, my dad came by one time and started telling his story. Apparently, it freaked this guy out really badly. He said he'd been outside, doing whatever, and all of a sudden this pure black dog comes by and starts staring him down, and then growling. The guy had a super uneasy feeling and started backing up to his door. Apparently, the moment he turned his back, he rushed in and slammed the door shut, and in that amount of time, this dog had lunged at the door, barking and scratching like crazy for a minute, and then it went silent. The guy said that he then heard this evil laughter and looked out the window to see the same guy that my dad had seen, all black, old school clothes from like 1800s, walking away laughing and then disappearing. My dad swears to this day that he didn't make up the story, and he doesn't usually tell anybody about it. He hates me ever sharing it as well, because it's so unbelievable and he hates people ever thinking he's dishonest. I believe him, though, and I'm sure most of you would as well. This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest, back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off. It's a forest, after all, and I kept walking. But then I started to hear a low, mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded exactly like my brother, saying, Come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance, because, although the voice sounded like my brother, something also sounded wrong, like it was distorted. So I waited a few seconds, and then he said again, Come here, I need your help. But in the exact same way as before, almost like it was a recording. So I moved to the side, and that's when I saw it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted. But the worst part was its eyes. They were exactly the same as mine. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed oddly friendly, but nonetheless I was scared, so I ran a mile back, and the whole time I could feel it behind me. 
When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappearing behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having dreams, but not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this, and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event that he experienced when he was young. To this very day, I remember how I felt and how threatened it made me feel. This story is one my dad told us when we were younger. This happened in central Wisconsin, when my dad was not even a teenager yet. Wisconsin was even more rural back then, and the area has since become more of a city. Anyway, here's the story. My dad and his friend grew up in the country and always walked woods, trails, swamping land, and the like. Not much else to do but my dad said that he and his friend were walking a path in one of these spots one day, and this black cat kept following them. Anytime they stopped, the cat stopped and stared at them. He said that they would try using stones, etc., not to throw at the cat, but just near it to try to scare it off, but the cat would never get scared. And after a few minutes, they started walking faster and the cat kept pace. Apparently, they both got a very bad feeling, and so they didn't look back anymore. Once they said that and started walking again, they heard this dark, evil laughter and turned around to see a man in super old-school, all-black attire walking away, laughing into the brush. So they freaked out, obviously, and ran away. As it turns out, my grandpa was friends with this other old guy who lived around the area, and I guess my dad knew him and would stop by. After this cat thing happened, my dad came by one time and started telling his story. Apparently, it freaked this guy out really badly. He said he'd been outside, doing whatever, and all of a sudden this pure black dog comes by and starts staring him down, and then growling. The guy had a super uneasy feeling, and started backing up to his door. Apparently, the moment he turned his back, he rushed in and slammed the door shut, and in that amount of time, this dog had lunged at the door, barking and scratching like crazy for a minute, and then it went silent. The guy said that he then heard this evil laughter and looked out the window to see the same guy that my dad had seen, all black, old school clothes from like 1800s, walking away laughing and then disappearing. My dad swears to this day that he didn't make up the story, and he doesn't usually tell anybody about it. He hates me ever sharing it as well, because it's so unbelievable and he hates people ever thinking he's dishonest. I believe him, though, and I'm sure most of you would as well. I just got home from a road trip, and I have been thinking about something I saw that I can't make sense of. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South, near Mount Shasta, California. It was about midnight, and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip, and like usual, I asked my wife if she saw it too, and she confirmed that she did. The body wasn't 100% clear because our headlights hadn't reached that section of the road yet. 
When we got to the exact point in the road where the animal crossed, we looked to the side to see if there was anything there. What we saw was a man, dressed in army fatigues, walking down the road. He didn't look at us. He just kept walking. It was pitch black, and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only lit up by our headlights. We both got full-body chills when we saw him, because, of course, we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical, mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings. This is like nothing I had ever experienced before. The closest thing that I can tell it might have been was some kind of skinwalker, but the details are kind of off. And anyway, we were fully creeped out. This story is a few years old, but it still bothers me, and I've never been able to find or come up with a clear answer to what it was. I was living in a super small town near Rochester, New York. I'm talking 302 people in the entire town, small. The whole place was extremely weird, but that's another story for another day. When this happened, it was early fall. My sister was going to college nearby, and my mom and I would pick her up every night. It was maybe 8 p.m. when we were pulling out of the driveway. That's when we both saw it. It was so thin I could see its ribs. Its skin was a weird shade of light gray. Its chest looked human. The anatomy was right. Collarbones, ribs but the rest of it didn't look human at all. Its legs were the weirdest part. It kind of glided across the ground. You know, with like a non-player character from a video game animation screws up and the footsteps are moving too slow for the amount of space that it's crossing? Yeah, it looked like that. Its actual movements were also weird. You know how dogs have that extra joint in their legs? It had that, but it was moving on two legs, and it didn't run like a dog does. It ran like a human, but with dog legs, if that makes any sense. It was small, maybe three feet tall. I remember that it had perfectly smooth skin, like a doll. I remember looking at its face, and I remember it looking at me. I remember our eyes meeting but I don't remember what its face looked like. I know I saw it. I did, but I just can't remember it. It's not like I forgot it either. Like the second I looked away, I didn't know what it looked like. My mom stopped the car just as it ran into the bushes. She had seen it too. We were both too scared to get out and look for it, but we both know what we saw. My mom's description was almost exactly like mine, although she says that she also felt overwhelming fear as soon as she saw it. I didn't feel that, but I did feel like I'd seen something I wasn't supposed to. She believes it was a demon. I don't think it was. It doesn't match up with what I've heard about demons. People that I've told this story to suggested it might be a skinwalker, and after a little bit of research, I don't know if that adds up either. In any case, it was definitely a cryptid. It was close to what a skinwalker might be, and it was definitely terrifying. I'm not sure if what I saw was a skinwalker or something similar to it, but it was still creepy. There are stories of creatures that take the form of animals and people to lure them away from town. I thought maybe it was similar to this. Maybe it was a skinwalker. Either way, this is my story. Two years ago, I went to visit my grandparents' place for the first time in years. It's a small town, and the house is located on a hill, which extends to an open landscape. It was night, 
and everyone was either in the kitchen or bedroom watching TV. I had to go to the bathroom. They only have one bathroom, and it's outside. So I make my way over, taking my phone. I saw the neighbor's black dog that comes during the day to play with us, and my grandparents' dog. Except it was weird for it to be outside at night. The whole property is surrounded by a concrete wall that has a tall, pointy metal fence on top. The only two gates accessible, the only two gates accessible, close and are locked at sunset. So there was no way it could have entered since my grandparents and my visiting family all made sure to put all the animals in their place before locking the gates. The gates are always closed unless a visitor comes or to let my grandparents' dog go play on the open land outside of the property with the neighbor's dog. There were no visitors that day and they wouldn't be playing at that time of night. Back to the story. I start making my way to the bathroom, and the dog appears from behind the bathroom building. It was wagging its tail and making these excited, low, panting noises that dogs make when they're happy to see their owners. I start walking toward it, and I see it gets all excited and comes toward me, so I'm petting it. Nothing was out of the ordinary. I just remember thinking how nice it was that this dog comes to play with my grandparents' dog. Then suddenly, it starts walking away from me, back to behind the bathroom. So I go after it, thinking I'll call the neighbors and tell them that if they want to come pick up their dog now, they can, or if they want to pick it up in the morning, that was fine too. Their house is close to the bottom of the hill, about a 15-minute walk. I wasn't about to walk alone in this town, I don't know. Halfway, going after it, I get this really weird feeling and stop. I see it standing there, just staring at me. And being my dumb self, I take a few steps toward it, extending my hand and calling out its name. But the dog starts backing away slowly, not letting go of any eye contact. This sends a red flag up immediately because of the way it stepped back and the way it wouldn't look away from my eyes. It creeped me out. It slowly stepped back into the dark. So, I turned my phone flashlight on and scanned the light around. I couldn't see it. It had gone too fast. I was going to go after it, because apparently I have no common sense. But just as I started walking forward, I hear this weird bark, followed by one long howl. It was not exactly dog-like. I know, I've grown up with all kinds of dogs. That's not what dogs sound like. It sounded wrong. I thought maybe it was hurt, so I ended up calling my dad to come and search for it. We scanned every inch of the property, but no dog. Both gates were locked. I got really creeped out after that, and I couldn't sleep well. I kept hearing that weird howl all night. We checked in with the neighbors the next morning, and apparently their dog was with them the whole time. I really don't like my grandparents' place at night. It's creepy as heck. The whole town is surrounded by creepy stories. Even my dad has had weird encounters with weird cloak people and strange lights where they shouldn't be. I have to go back this year. And I'm kind of terrified. Some people have told me that what I saw was not a skinwalker. Some have said that it was a flesh gate or a crawler. But in any case, it was like a skinwalker, and the story was no less terrifying. It was around 10 o'clock at night off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. It was my mom, her boyfriend, my sister, and I. We were driving home from our vacation, and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night, and this was a scenic route. We were driving down, and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was ironically on my phone texting and listening to music, we eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to, 
It was boring. But I occasionally looked up every now and then, as I did for the entire ride. It was a straight path forward, with nothing but streetlights. So we were driving and driving, and as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half-sleep or trance. Then I suddenly woke up. Everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there was no muffled conversation. Everything seemed weirdly calm. But then I had this sudden awareness. We were in the middle of the woods. It was dark and around 11.30 to midnight, and without the streetlights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. I immediately felt very paranoid and a weird vibe. I turned my phone on and listened to music. Then we entered back onto another streetlight stretch, and we drove on. Now this part is strange, because it was almost as if something told me to go on my phone, as if there was some kind of a notification. I checked, and nothing was there. And then I noticed something in my peripheral vision. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off. In an area where the road kind of turns. This was a fairly wooded area, and you couldn't see much without light, so we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out of the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving. It was limping. But when it fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone-chilling. A naked, ash-white, skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped, and as I saw it, it turned its head toward us. Its eyes were a deep charcoal black. We sped up faster and started driving. It wasn't human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car weightlessly defying physics. My mom's car had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I did get a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scariest part for me was that when it jumped over the car, our sunroof was open. We all saw the same thing. I just don't know what it was. My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington, New Mexico. We mostly deliver small packages out to the middle of nowhere that are too much of a hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with. My dad is the only employee, and we have a few pickup trucks and a trailer. One day, we get a delivery out to Window Rock, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation, about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he's chilling with his Navajo friend, Travis, and his girlfriend. Travis mentions how he's got family in Window Rock that he hasn't seen in ages and suggests that they go with him. I was about six or seven at the time, and it was the summertime, so dad decides we'll all go down together. He can do his delivery really quick, then while Travis sees his family, we can go check out the Window Rock. This is a big rock face with a large hole in it that goes to the other side. It's pretty cool. We had to convoy in separate trucks since my dad's was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some walkie-talkies so we could communicate with one another. We spend our time in Window Rock. Everything is generally uneventful, and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of the Window Rock trip, but this next part I will never forget. We're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup, New Mexico. It had just rained earlier in the day, and the road was kind of slick, so we were taking it pretty slow. On the left of the highway, there is nothing but sandstone cliffs 
and on the right, there is a huge field separated from the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of the hill, and down at the bottom of the hill, we see what appears to be a very large dog, sitting back on its haunches in the middle of the road, facing the cliffs. My dad calls over the radio. Hey, Trav, you see that big-ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio. That is not a dog. Speed up and hit it. Speed up right now and hit it. He sounds almost hysterical. He just keeps screaming, Hit it, please, you have to hit that thing right now. So, my dad starts to speed up, and as we get a bit closer, I can begin to see it a little more clearly. It's covered in this brown, wiry, matted hair that appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs, but the moment our headlights hit it, it turns and looks at us, and this thing has a face. I don't know how else to describe it, other than a mix between a bear's face and a human's face. It looks twisted and distorted and almost in pain. As we get closer to this thing, we start to realize that it's actually freaking huge. Though it was still sitting on its haunches, it is about shoulder height with the hood of the truck. We get literally inches from hitting it when it lets out this scream that sounds like someone screaming as their lungs were filling with water, and it leaps backwards towards the field, landing just on our side of the barbed wire fence. Then, with another leap, it was gone from sight. Travis comes over the radio again. Holy shit. Keep driving. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. He kept repeating that last part. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. Pretty soon, we're speeding like crazy, and just as we start to come up near the outskirts of Gallup, we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally, this makes the cop, a Navajo man himself, very on edge, and he immediately asks why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. Travis says, we just saw a skinwalker a few miles back and it's been following us. The officer immediately turns white, stammers something about a verbal warning, gets in his car, and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night, but when we got home, Travis refused to let us leave without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that was supposed to keep it away. So yeah, I guess that's my skinwalker story. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school, over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you that I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my, at that time, boyfriend's house, which took roughly 15 minutes, so let's say about 10.45 at night. I was full of energy at this age and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with the warm summer nighttime breeze, car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its jerk cops. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat, so I could really speed. And that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I'd take a right turn that was more than 90 degrees, almost back the way I had come. Then, in exactly half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much, 
because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel, and it would be a waste, as I would have to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could really let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where this all went down. A house had recently been built there, two stories with a detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected as we built our family house and it took us a year to finish it. I will start at the beginning because I believe that this is all related. Week 1. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just bebopping away, when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white, real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and I've even met a quarter wolf in person. They look different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it, and I notice that it's not minding me at all. It is sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road staring at the house, almost unblinking. Its ears didn't even flick toward me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to be behaving like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric, like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Indian stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. My mom would never believe me if I told her that I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I got to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week 2 I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolf buddy hoping to see him again around that area, so I drove extra slow with my window down and radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road, approaching the new little house. Then I saw the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity, my reality, and possibility of eldritch terrors of Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black, with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated, with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright, and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terribly long fingers. While its legs had bulk to them and looked equipped for running, with back-facing knees for sprinting, and tipped-in raptor-like curved claws, it looked tall, maybe seven foot or more, just folded up in this predator's posture, waiting for prey. And then there were its eyes, solid black and sunken, 
I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. And then I realized, it's going to see me, and there's no avoiding it. Panic, terror unique to this alien thing, swallowed me instantly. Feeling like I was tilting off of the world, I had always known, and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up, or I would be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car, and I would become an unsolved mystery. I had a manual crank window. Screw me. I had a crank window because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But in that moment, I realized that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning toward me, and I had to let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I had to get my window up first, and I was cranking it as hard as I could. I was starting to cry as I finally got the window closed, and then... I put my gas pedal to the floor, gravel road be damned. I thought I must not look as I pass. I must not look at it or make direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things, and I had already seen too much. My tires had found grip, and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs, and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed, I thought. I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see darkness, as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick that I learned a long time ago to tap my brakes softly enough that the light comes on, but that I don't actually slow down. Red lit up the dust that was billowing up in my wake, but amidst the swirling chaos, I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest. A tall, thin shadow. I had enough and decided I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 109 miles an hour, which is fast as I can go before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a right onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I didn't. When I got home, nobody was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time, so I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain. He was dismissive and thought I was pulling a joke on him, and then he thought I was just being crazy and seeing things. There are uh, many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity definitely contributed. Week 3 I refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have to leave my boyfriend's house a bit early, and he'd been making fun of me about this all week. One of the days we went to a park to walk around, and on the way back he decided he wanted to drive by the house where I saw that thing. I was hysterical, begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded. So as we got closer, and I could not stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic of getting near that place. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night in my mind again. At one point, he stopped the car. Spooky. You have to see this, he said. No, I whined, resisting him pulling at my arm. No, no, you really have to see this. Look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone. 
burnt clear down to the foundation, with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted, no, let's get out of here, while I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. He said, there was no evidence of any personal belongings, furniture, power wiring, interior walls even. It doesn't seem like other burnt out houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area, but there weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered, as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't even have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten, my skin crawl, and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it. A thing that is nothing like any creature known to humans, yet I still saw it. I don't know what I saw to this day, but I hope I never see anything like it again. So I moved into my grandparents' house around five months ago, but I spent a lot of my childhood there as well. I smoke, so I find myself alone out on my back deck a lot at evening and nighttime. The deck faces the garden portion of my backyard. To my left is the alley between our neighbor's fence, and to my right is a cemented area, including my garage and the rest of my house. And at night, even with a bright porch light, my backyard is dark dark to the point that you can't see a foot past the deck. We have three sets of small motion lights that are continuously set off throughout the night, as well as a camera facing the backyard that will send motion notifications. And when watching the footage, there is only ever bushes and trees moving, maybe an insect. I've heard noises every single time I go out there at night, and at first... As any person would do, I passed it off as animals. The noises included thumps and scratching on the rain guard above the deck, footstep-like sounds on the concrete and gravel being scattered, which is visible from my deck. I've seen gravel tossed around with no possible cause in the area. Branches crack above me and in front of me, and trees and bushes are rustled. I have seen a humanoid figure twice in the farthest part of my garden, which both times I instantly went into my house, of course. I constantly feel like I'm being watched. Depending on what I'm hearing, I've felt worse. And I absolutely hate going outside at night here by myself. Just tonight I heard something that I haven't heard before, and the only thing I can compare it to is the screeching noise that squirrels can make, but mixed with an inhuman scream. I freaked out and went inside. I know a lot about cryptids, specifically wendigos and skinwalkers, and I really can't imagine that being what it is. But I also know what animals sound like, and this isn't any of them either. I can't find any proof of it being an animal either. Honestly, something is in my backyard but I have no idea what it is. We are from a small town in southern Ohio, about an hour east of Cincinnati. This town has been plagued with people dying young, and in some pretty gruesome ways. Google Cheryl Fossil as an example. Many believe that this is caused by, or the cause of, activity around the area. 
There's a section of woods that seems to have a concentrated activity throughout. The woods in question are surrounded by two churches, a hospital, and an area of housing. Now, as full disclosure, things do not happen every time we go into the woods, but when things do happen, they happen off the charts. The most common things that we've experienced are what we've dubbed the geeks. We call these things geeks because they're tall, sometimes 12 foot from toe to crown. They're gangly and they move awkwardly, although they move between trees swiftly. They never present themselves outwardly, only glimpses of them as they shift between the trees. The scariest thing about them, however, is the sound right before they start moving. It's almost like a deep groan. The second thing that I want to talk about is the Hydra. Only one of us has seen this thing, and so far there has only ever been one witnessed. It's like a small primate creature, with a face like a hideous woman, a chimpanzee body, long greasy black hair, and boils on its back. Blood red boils. The member of our group who has encountered this thing refused to tell us what the Hydra spoke about. These are some of the things we've encountered. We're working on a documentary about what's happening in the area and the town itself. It's fascinating, and it's terrifying. And if anyone else has any similar experiences, I would love to hear about them. We don't know what we saw. We were in the Dominican Republic, staying at a locally owned hotel. It was a nice hotel, but nothing luxe, and a very open-air sort of place. We had gone out for dinner and enjoyed a bottle of wine, but we weren't drunk. I'm reading in bed, and my husband comes from the bathroom, completely white-faced and in shock. Um, Kitty, there's a... There's a spider in the bathroom. I looked at him and I laughed. Spiders in the Dominican Republic are big, but nothing to freak out over. He looked like he'd just seen Satan himself. So I go to the bathroom. All I see are four thick, hairy, orange and black legs coming out of the sink basin. They were at least 10 inches long and at least as thick as pencils. Very hairy. From about five feet away, I could see the separate orange and black hairs. I'm short, so I couldn't see the whole thing over the sink from the distance that I was at. There was a towel blocking the direct view. But just by the legs I saw, I knew that I was looking at almost a two-foot-long spider. I calmly walk back to my husband. Did you see it? Did you see it? I nod, and we leave the room to get help. We went to the front desk. Our broken Spanish had the staffers in hysterical laughter, not to mention what they took as overreacting tourists scared of a little spider. One staffer, Jose, came to look, and it was gone. Jose tells us that he has at least three in his home, which is when I realize that these people either don't believe me or don't understand what I'm saying. I've lived in tropical climates before. There is no way in hell you would share a home with the spider that we saw. A day later and we have a normal spider infestation. I go to the desk and I ask for bug spray. The staffers are still having a wild laugh at our expense, but the same guy, Jose, comes up with me and gives me the spray. We're helping clean up the spiders, which are about five inches or so daddy long leg types. He's surprised that I'm not suddenly scared by these spiders. He asks why, and I inform him that these spiders are not what we saw the other night. I used my hands to show him the size of what we saw. His mouth dropped. I've never heard of anything like that in my entire life in the Dominican Republic, but who knows what comes out of that jungle. 
It wasn't until a little while later that my husband, while discussing Harry, our pet name for the spider, realized that I had only seen half of it. My estimate of 10-inch legs and 10-inch legs for a total of about 20 inches, so 2 feet, was severely off. He saw the whole body, and the body, minus the legs, was as wide as an entire hand, a grown man's hand, so it was likely way bigger than a two-foot diameter. He said there were multiple big black eyes. I have since gone on numerous arachnid websites and have even contacted arachnologists to try to identify what we saw. Most came back suggesting a Mexican spider that I now have forgotten the name of that might have somehow made its way to the Dominican Republic in somebody's luggage. Trust me, I looked it up. That spider is not what we saw. What we saw was a Spidersaurus rex. To this day, I don't know what kind of cryptid thing that was, but I really hope I never have to see anything like it again. If anybody knows what we saw, please let us know. This happened in Tampico, Tamaulipas, Mexico. This happened to myself, my little brother, and cousin. I was about 14 years old, and it was around dusk. We decided to go play basketball at the outside courts. It was still daylight when we first got there, and we usually start heading home about dusk or when the court lights come on. It was only a few blocks away from our grandma's house. When the lights come on is usually when the bigger kids get to the court to play, but this time we were fortunate enough to have the whole court to ourselves. We were shooting hoops like normal, nothing out of the ordinary, and the lights came on, but we were having fun anyway. The game was 21, so two of us would stand to the side of the hoop depending on which direction the ball would go, so it wouldn't roll to the street. And on one of these shots that my cousin made, the ball just missed the hoop and bounced behind it. I managed to grab it before leaving the court when I saw a strange creature. It was like a little person, no bigger than two feet. It had the face of an old man with a fairly large nose, old raggedy clothes that looked like they were handmade, and a hat something like a garden gnome would wear. One of those pointy hats, but it wasn't straight up. It hung down to the side. It was crouched down, almost like it was in hiding. When I got too close to it, that's when it stood up, looked at me, and ran away. Believe me, my first thought was not to chase it. I was scared stiff, but my cousin and little brother had seen it too, and they ran. When it ran, it was heading for the other side of the court. I couldn't believe the speed of this thing. To be so small, it made it to the other side in mere seconds, in almost the blink of an eye. It ran behind the post, and it was gone. I snapped out of it, and I started to run home as well. And as I ran past the same post that this thing had gone behind, I turned to look to see if it was there, but it was gone. When I got home, my little brother and cousin had already told the adults what had happened, and they told us that what we had seen was a creature called a duende. Apparently, there are different types of them, too. That's my experience. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar and used to wildlife and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogman. It charged me and my cousin. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how it did, and it was not a normal wolf, as they can't comfortably run on two legs, whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing it. I'll elaborate. 
This happened around June or July of 2007. I was around 17 years old and a lot more cocky then, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwest Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin, or at least by the bonfire, by the beach, because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and the beach, and at night, you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy. That is until this incident. This happened somewhere between noon and 4 p.m. My cousin and I were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters into about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point, and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me, when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said, We're being watched. He froze. And then I realized that the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked, and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right, when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds, but it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to the tree with its arms grasping the trunk, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish-brown fur. I told my cousin, we have to go. And the next thing I know, he's sprinting, and I look back at Wolfie, who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet. And that's when I turned and ran. Looked like Wolfie was dropping on all fours. It charged us. Sounded right on our asses, barreling through the brush, but for whatever reason it let us go when we broke out of that tree line and headed for the cabin. I say let us go because there's no reason that it couldn't have got us. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size. Wolfie appeared to be nearly seven feet tall when upright, and that where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large clawed hands. Now, I'm not sure how to explain it away rationally. I've heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs, nor do wolves get that big. And black bears waddle on two legs, but they certainly don't sprint. The closest description is silly, a werewolf or a dogman, but it is literally the only explanation I have. I walk on a cane thanks to illness, but I do enjoy the woods where I grew up. You can tell me all day long about how the woods are scary and bad, but to a German country boy, going through the woods in Bavaria, clocking in at over six feet tall with a sturdy cane, there's not much terrifying stuff going on. The worst I ever saw was a single, confused wild boar. It went on the way, noticed me smoking my pipe, grunted and went away. I kept my distance from it and didn't mess with it. Live and let live. It was probably just as confused to see me as I was to see it. Now, after a few years, I had the wanderlust again. So when I went to my mother's to visit her, who lives kind of near the woods, I went, let's have a pipe of tobacco, if necessary. You seem to have to clarify it when Americans are present, and a stroll through the woods. Now, the climate was typical for Bavaria. Nice wind, some clouds, but a bit toward the evening. So, after walking for a while with my headphones in, I get this tickle on the back of my neck. Now, I must repeat this here. I am over six feet, built to scale, and I have a cane. 
I have seen nothing scarier than the master woodsman tapping me on the shoulder and asking me what the heck is wrong with me for smoking in the woods, with his gun suspiciously almost pointed at me. I'm not... I'm not scared of anything, and I can use that cane if worse comes to worse to give anybody quite a thrashing. I pull up the headphones and check my senses. Sight is clear. I just hear this noise, like a very spastic squirrel running full speed into a pile of dead leaves. Strange, but not unheard of. Squirrels usually have this kind of madness about them, and to be honest, it's not hurting anybody, so screw it, let them run. I treat them like drunk people. As long as they're not hurting anybody, fine by me. I've done silly things in my life, too. I grab my cane closer, put my headphones on low, and put them back in, keeping, you know, an ear out for trouble. I walk on, and the tickling doesn't go away. And I keep thinking this through, because what the heck, I usually don't react this way. Then it hits me. I have walked for perhaps ten minutes, and the skittering sound hasn't disappeared. That must be one dedicated squirrel, I think. Then I think, well, maybe it wants nuts or something. It's just bored out of its mind, or whatever. Nothing harmful, right? After all, from the skittering noise, it's light. It's making way too much noise to be sneaky. So finally, I get curious. I turn around and track the skittering like just by seeing where the noise is the strongest and where the motion is. As anybody knows who has ever played hide-and-seek in the woods, that's pretty effective. I suddenly notice the skittering is in front of me, to the right, near where an old logging road goes off from the way, and I'm thinking, huh, am I going to see a squirrel drunk on bad apples or what? Might be worth a chuckle. So I just go, harumph, because if they're actually scared of me, this gives them the proper time to get lost. Nothing. The skittering continues. So I put my best swagger on, and as I look around the curve, I see it. In the half-dark of the forest, hanging in mid-air, about 25 to 30 meters away, is a glowing blue light. A soft glow, I give you that, but still a glow, swaying side to side, and right where the skittering is supposed to be, by my ears. I only stare at it, and I notice that it's dead quiet. No skittering, no nothing, just quiet. It's hanging there in mid-air, roughly at knee level, and I'm looking at it, not knowing what to make of this thing. It's still eerie. Then the skittering sets in again, and it moves toward me, not swaying side to side, not floundering about, but beeline straight at me. Now, as I said before, I'm six foot plus. I am by no means a small guy, and I have a good stable cane. But at that point in time, the horror I felt was nothing like anything before, and I noped out of there. I am not squeamish against anything. I know my forest critters, and I know the occasional prank, because gods know that I've played some in my day. I just noped out of there for roughly a half an hour at as high of a speed as I could go until I was near civilization. Now, if I had to describe what really freaked me out, and believe me, I've thought long and hard about it. You know those horror movies where they have that trope like squelching violin and you know soon that something's going to happen? Mix that with nails on a crossboard, but remove all the sounds. Just leave your response to it. That's what I felt. Now, as I said, there was no rational reason to be that afraid, and looking back, I doubt that whatever it was could have seriously withstood a blow from my cane just based on size. For all I know, some jackass caught himself a squirrel, drugged it with enough caffeine and meth to make it skitter like crazy, and painted it with bioluminescent paint. No qualms about that. I just didn't see it with my eyes. What really got to me, though, was the feeling of suddenly, without any build-up, having that horror, that reaction to flee. Even for a German and a Bavarian, I am tall, and I have the mass to back it up. But for a simple blue light to scare the crap out of me like that, makes you think. I never saw the light again. I'm not sure what it was, but damn it, 
I have since then not stepped foot into that wood, and I prefer walking the open fields and the village-to-village roads before I go back at dusk to this place in the woods. My best guess is that I saw fairies, but to this day I have no idea One of the more curious paranormal incidents in Georgia is the Georgia werewolf, Emily Isabella Burt. Apparently, Miss Burt was a resident of Talbot County, a rural county in southwest Georgia between Macon and Columbus. The Burt family, a wealthy and prominent family in the Talbot County community, had several children. Of all of her children, it appears that Emily Isabella was the one with the most problems. For one, she had inherited a lot of physical traits from her father, including dark hair and bushy eyebrows. However, she was said to have had sharp white canine teeth that made her smile quite disturbing. In one report, Roberts claims that Emily Isabella's mother took her to a local dentist to see if the teeth could be altered in any way. He could do nothing for her. Soon afterwards, she fell ill and suffered from restless nights. Emily is said to have strangely wandered the county during her restless nights. Legend has it that the beau of one of Emily Isabella's sister, a William Gorman, reported to the Burts that something was killing his sheep. Fearful that this may soon be happening to her animals, Mrs. Mildred Burt became quite concerned. On ensuing visits, Gorman would recount stories about more sheep killings and that some of his cattle were being killed as well. He was concerned about the killings and decided to take action. He reported that he was going to be putting together what amounted to a posse. Their intentions were to shoot and kill whatever beast was doing the damage. Emily Isabella was unusually interested in what was going on and what events had transgressed in the hunt for this animal. On the night of the big hunt, Mildred Burt, who also had inherited more than a few guns and was a great markswoman, went out with her pistol. She apparently suspected that Emily Isabella was somehow involved with the killings, and she wanted to be prepared for anything. As she was near the area, an animal lunged for her, and she fired. It ran away. Interestingly enough, the next morning it was reported that Emily Isabella had a bullet hole in her left hand. After being taken to a local physician, Her mother decided to send her to Paris to be treated by a doctor who specialized in lycanthropy, a disorder that made its victims think they were werewolves. While she was in Paris, the attack stopped, and once she returned, supposedly cured, the attacks fell to a minimum. Emily died in 1911 and is buried in a small cemetery out in the wilderness of Georgia, To this day, a number of paranormal incidents are reported in the area, with the grave itself generally believed to be haunted by the ghost of the werewolf. People report a strange stillness or sense of unease around the cemetery, and the grave itself is strangely well kept, even though the cemetery itself is overgrown and forgotten. Others have reported that when small tokens are taken from the cemetery, Bad things happen to them not long afterward. There are even some people who note that even just talking poorly of Emily or her family causes the same problems to happen. It's as if the werewolf does not want anyone else to speak ill of her. This happened to my uncle when I was about seven years old. He's no longer with us, and I want to share his story. Growing up, I lived in northern Michigan on 5,000 acres of farm and ranch land that backed up into state land. Nothing but miles of forest and pasture could be seen. Needless to say, it made us pretty tough, and it takes a lot to spook us. 
We are all avid hunters, fishermen, and outdoorsmen. Being the only girl, I was raised as a bit of a tomboy, and I'm just the same. My uncle went off to join the military, becoming a senior NCO in a prominent Special Forces Division of the U.S. Navy. He was six foot four, built like a wrestler, obviously skilled in survival tactics, and nothing rattled him. He was home on leave and went out hunting as it was deer season. I remember him coming in the house shaking and crying, saying that he saw something in the woods. My uncle never cried. He was tough as nails and would tear someone to shreds before he let them make him cry. My grandmother tried to get him to make sense, but he kept saying that he saw Bigfoot mixed with a wolf. My granny immediately got my grandfather, and he rounded up the rest of the guys. A few male cousins, my dad, my uncle, who was still terrified but went because he didn't want to be labeled a chicken, and a few other guys all got their shotguns and ammunition and saddled the horses to go clear the woods. Apparently they were aware of the dog man, but I was blissfully young and ignorant. They told me to stay inside, and for no reason was I to step outside of our house until they returned. I had never heard my dad or grandfather so serious, so I hid in my room. Sunset comes, and they still aren't back. I'm really worried at this point because they never stayed in the woods after dark. Shortly, I heard the sound of horses running to the barn and their voices. I was so relieved. They looked troubled when they came into the house but didn't say anything, probably because they didn't want to spook me. At dinner, though, my dad laid down the law. I was no longer allowed to play outside or go to the barns alone. I had to have my grandfather with me at all times. Of course, I was upset by this and felt that my independence was being taken away, but I obeyed. The next morning, my dad and grandfather taught me how to shoot, and that's when I knew that it was serious. I overheard the adults talking the next night. Apparently, there were tracks where my uncle had his sighting bigger than any wolf could make, but they were definitely dog tracks. As I said before, we are avid outdoorsmen and hunters. We can identify tracks easily, but these, they couldn't be identified. About eight foot up in a tree, there were claw marks. No Michigan bear could make those. They also found claw marks of about the same height on multiple trees throughout our property. There was mutilated cattle and they'd been mutilated in a way that no coyote or bear would. And this lasted the whole winter. We lost about 30 to 40 cattle that winter, all of them mutilated, all with the same wolf and dog tracks in the snow. I really feel like this experience changed my uncle. Who knows, he did multiple tours in the Middle East for Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom before he took his own life. After that experience, though, he was never the same. He went from someone who would never drink to seeing him down about a bottle of Jack with no problem. His eyes were always haunted. He changed his personality, never went out in the woods again. He quit hunting, and eventually he just quit coming home. He didn't even come home for my dad's funeral two years later. It was heartbreaking to see him deteriorate the way he did. That thing in the woods might not have killed him there and then, but I truly believe he saw something out there, and it ultimately killed him. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed this collection of stories. They are definitely not new, but they are still good stories, and I definitely enjoyed revisiting some of them. So thank you for indulging me in a compilation while I work on some other things. Dracula is not going to narrate itself, and uh, I am using the evenings to narrate Dracula, which is usually when I 
narrate stuff for you guys. So, I mean, it's all for you guys, but you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, I, I, something had to give. So I have been recording stories that I still have collected from Reddit and just sort of uh, filing them away in like categories of stories, essentially, you know, so like I have a file for skinwalkers and a file for haunted house and all this. So, um, I think there might be some mixed videos for the rest of November where like half are new and half are old. Um, but there are also a ton of newcomers. So thank you guys for subscribing. And you guys probably, I mean, I think it's unlikely that every person has heard every story in every video, right? So I like compilations because um, they give us a chance to hear stories we might have missed the first time. So, um, thank you for being patient with me whilst I finish up Dracula. I do think that I'm on track to have that bad boy done by the end of November. If not, it, it, it's like maybe the first two days of December, but very shortly thereafter. So I'm very excited about that. I'm already thinking about which novel to narrate next, but in the meantime, we will have some Lovecraft and some Poe. Mm. So I am very excited about that as well. I believe the first Lovecraft story that I'm going to narrate um, is actually going to be the, uh, the Color from Space. I always forget what the title of that is exactly, but I think it's the, it's either The Color from Out of Space or The Color from Space or something like that. But um, I suck at titles. I don't know. Um, but another person online who is not a horror channel per se, um, but who does narrate from time to time is Peter Draws. And I love his channel and I'm just, I'm all over just his whole vibe. He's awesome. If, if you're into quirky awesomeness, just head on over. Um, I will leave a link to his version of uh, the color. I think it's the color out of space. I got to look that up. It's going to drive me crazy. If I was professional, I would have looked that up before I said it. But what what are we expecting here? Um, So I will leave a link to his narration of that. And if I can find it also his narration of Kafka's The Metamorphosis. Um, he's actually the one who inspired me to narrate The Metamorphosis, which is coming up as well uh, in December. And yeah, so I am really excited to do that. But it's a great channel. He's quirky and awesome. You guys will really love him. So I will um, put his information in the description below. And yeah, and he also does some really cool like uh, pen and ink, uh, like abstract pen and ink artwork. Um, and that's what he is narrating over. So you'll get some visuals over there too. <laughs> So anyway, I'll leave that down below. No affiliation or anything like that. I just, I just really appreciate his work. So uh, I will put that down in the description for you guys to check out. And also uh, I've recorded this outro twice now, hoping to get it shorter, but really, who am I kidding? Uh, if I haven't mentioned it yet in this outro, also uh, Mortis Media had me over on his channel again this week for a haunted house video. I feel like I said that already, but again, this is like I have recorded this before, so if I'm repeating myself, I'm very sorry. Um, but definitely go over and check out that video as well. I will leave it in the video description. I think that's all I have for you guys tonight. I'm going to go narrate some more Dracula, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. Ooh.